Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, rooting your Android device might be a lot more dangerous than you realize, why the insurance companies will be taking over InfoSec, and the NSA prepares for quantum encryption. And then it's a fantastic batch of your questions, a rock and roundup, and a heck of a lot more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi, everyone, and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 230 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on August 27th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by our three fine sponsors, DigitalOcean, Ting, and IX Systems. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this here show goes on. Our live stream, why, that's powered by the incredible Scale Engine over at ScaleEngine.com. You should go check that out. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the tech, and the teacher, Mr. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Alan, it's good to see you. I feel like I have just saw you about five minutes ago. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> uh, we are actually recording ahead today because Alan's traveling soon. Uh, I think your and next then traveling stop- some more and then traveling some more. Yeah, I think your next more. stop is VBSDCon, right? Yes, yeah. uh, which is in Reston, Virginia. It's September 11th through 13th. Mm, there you go. So we are recording this week uh, to make up for that. And... Uh, our first story is one that might hit home to some Android enthusiasts in the audience who love to mm-hmm. root their devices. I have a feeling they might not love this first story, but it's kind of important, isn't it, Alan? Yeah. Uh, well, it's even it not, doesn't necessarily require you to root the device. Uh, this mm. is since uh, June of 2015, uh, SecureList, which is Kaspersky, has seen a steady growth in the number of mobile malware attacks that use super user uh, privileges or root access on the device to achieve their goal. Uh, you know, root access is incompatible with the operating system security model because it violates the principle that applications should be isolated from each other because once something is root, it has access to everything. Uh, it gives an application using root access a virtually unlimited control of the device, which is completely unacceptable in the case of a malicious application. Right. It says, uh, malicious use of super user privileges is not new in itself. In regions where smel- uh, smartphones are sold with uh, privilege escalation tools pre-installed on them, malware writers have long been using these techniques. I didn't realize uh, that was common in some markets. Yeah. Um, well, uh, as I think they allude to later in the article, in some countries, you, when you buy a phone in like an open-air market or whatever, it comes with the malware already installed. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> nice. Uh, but they say that, you know, Privilege escalations uh, pre-installed the malware writers using that, and that there are also known cases of Trojans gaining such privileges after the user rooted the device, uh, uh, you know, used or used uh, vulnerabilities to install applications that gave. Uh, so, so sometimes the application will wait until the user roots their device and then take advantage of it. It lurks. Yeah. Or some of them will just know of a vulnerability that you use to root a device and will root it for you so they can take over. That's so nice. you didn't even you just installed some app, you're not trying to root your device, and it roots it so it can install its malware. <laughs> uh, so uh, Kaspersky analyzed the statistics that they collected between May and August of this year and identified uh, a bunch of Trojan families that use root pl- uh, privileges without the user's knowledge at all. So there's uh, Trojan uh, ZTorg, uh, Trojan Dropper uh, Gorpo, yeah. uh, which operates in conjunction with uh, FadeB. And then there's also a Trojan Downloader, uh, Android OS. Leech. And says, all of these uh, mobile malware families can install programs. Uh, their f- uh, functionality is, in effect, limited uh, to providing the capability to download and install any application on the phone without the user's knowledge. So they're just the framework. Uh, and they, you know, these are sold on those underground mm. uh, hacker forums. And then the the person who buys this stuff then just bundles it with their own actual malware that they install on the phone to do whatever they want, whether that's, you know, send premium text messages or, you know, send emails, uh, messages to premium services to make money, make phone calls, uh, steal all the pictures off your phone, sure. and access your email, whatever they want to do. Uh, a distinctive feature of these mobile Trojans is that they are uh, packaging into legitimate applications but not in any way connected with the application's original purpose. Mm. Uh, cyber criminals uh, simply take uh, popular legit apps and add malicious code without affecting the main functionality. There was an interesting one uh, they were talking about with uh, the Android store where it pretended to be a clone of the Microsoft How Old Am I picture processing thing. Do you remember that one? Yeah, the, yeah, the How Old camera. Yeah. Uh, well, that was a Microsoft thing. It wasn't available on Android, but somebody made the How Old camera and threw it up on Android, uh-huh. and it used dynamic code loading. So when uh, the application went through the testing at Google, it found that everything was fine. 
Uh, and then later, the program, after a certain date or whatever, the program would start just downloading malicious code uh, into the app and running it. So, you know, it was basically able to get through Google's testing process as a legit app and then start loading the yeah. malware after it was approved. Because it was legit when Google checked it. Yeah. Uh, you know, basically took a picture and put up a random number or something. Wow. Uh, but then it started loading the uh, malware after the fact and taking over the phone. They say, uh, after launching the Trojans' attempt to exploit Android OS uh, vulnerabilities uh, known to you know, one or other of the... Uh, the malwares, and then they gain the super user privilege. Mm. Uh, in case of success, a standalone version of the malware is installed in the sys, uh, system slash app folder. Right. Uh, it regularly connects to the cyber criminal servers, waits for commands, and downloads and install other applications. So they have a nice uh, automatic update feature for the malware. <laughs> How nice. Keep, it yeah. up to, keep it up to date with all the latest goodies. Yeah. Uh, so then they break down a couple of those different uh, malware families we talked about. So the Leech uh, family is the most advanced. Um, some of his versions can bypass the dynamic checks performed by Google before applications appear in the Google Play Store. Hmm. Uh, malware from this family can obtain, based on device IP address, uh, using a resource called ipinfo.io, a range of data, including the country of uh, registration, nice. the address, uh, domain names matching the IP address. You know, Then the Trojan checks whether the IP address is in a range used by Google. Right, so it passes and if the it test. Is, then it, it it fakes it out. Yeah, and then if it's oh, this is a Google IP, I better make sure I pass the test, and it doesn't sh yeah. it doesn't light up. Yep. The malware also uses uh, dynamic code loading techniques to load the malware into the app after the fact, so it doesn't you know there's not a blob of malware uh, that gets shipped to Google. Uh, this is involves downloading all critical important modules and loading them into the context at runtime. This makes the static analysis done by Google uh, especially difficult. As a result of using all the techniques I uh, described above, the Trojan made it onto the official Google Play Store <laughs> as part of an application called the How Old Camera yep. and uh, apparently had as many as 100,000 downloads before it got taken down. Whoa. Uh, with the Zetorg family, uh, this uh, Trojan family belongs um, about the same functionality as previously described. Uh, the distribution techniques used uh, match those employed by Trojans like uh, Gorpo and Fadeby. Um, the malicious code packages are embedded in legitimate applications. Mm. The only significant difference is that the latest version of this malware uses a uh, protection technique that enables them to completely hide code from the static analysis done by Google. Uh, the attackers use a uh, protector that replaces the application's executable file with a dummy, uh, decrypting the original executable file and loading it into the process address space only once the application has been launched. Clever. Uh, additionally, string obfuscation is used to uh, make the task of analyzing these files especially difficult so that security research can't figure out how they work. Yeah, yeah, if you make, especially if you're dynamically loading that, and <laughs> that's yeah. amazing. So the payload so, can just be brought in on demand when you need it. Yeah, and most importantly, most of these are now don't require, uh, they don't only affect people who have rooted their phone because the virus will just root your phone for you yeah, how nice. uh, in order to exploit you. Well, that's wonderful. So that solves me some work. <laughs> yep. Uh, well, it could be really interesting here is, you know, uh, we talked about some of those um, uh, banks saying, hey, you can't use our banking app if you rooted your phone. Mm -hmm. Well, turns out that... Uh, I didn't know I rooted my phone. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, I didn't root my phone. A virus did. Yeah, I'm somebody else my bank yeah. stopped me from banking on it. Yeah, yeah. Wow, Alan, wow. There's a bit of a mess there. So there's several yeah. different families that are doing this now. And the fact that they seem to be building themselves with getting past the Play Store in mind, and it's always, that's, boy, that's, that really scares me in a, way, in a way because you'd like to be able to say if it's in the Play Store, it's safe. Yep. But, uh, but you know, we've also covered researchers finding ways to get around the Apple one even. Mm -hmm. uh, Couldn't you do the same things theoretically actually, on the iOS device? Exactly, same things. Uh, but uh, I remember one university made apps where the app would actually record it being tested and report it once it actually had access later on. Right. And they found that, you know, in some cases, Apple was running the app for 1.7 seconds. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. Most, of, most of it was, you know, static analysis, and yeah. then at the end, it would actually run it to make sure it worked or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I do recall that. That's, that's a good one. Good callback, Alan. Okay, any other thoughts on that story? Uh, no, that's about it for that one. And then I'll tell you about DigitalOcean, the first sponsor of the TechSnap program. DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to get your own server spun up, and you can use our promo code SNAPOcean. 
Snap Ocean will give you a $10 credit. You can try out a $5 rig two months for free. And you can get started in less than a minute. And pricing plans are all starting at only $5 in less than a minute. That's amazing. And $5 a month gets you 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, London, and Germany. They have several in some of these locations, too. So you have a lot of options, a lot of flexibility. That one in Germany is sweet, and they have a really good interface to manage all of it. Power users are going to have no problem because it's still very advanced, but new users are going to really feel at home as well. And they have an API to help you take advantage of all of that on a larger scale. Go over to DigitalOcean and check them out. They have very straightforward pricing, so you can just go up depending on what your needs are. I, uh, I have, I think it's a it's either the ten or twenty dollar droplet uh, for uh, for Minecraft. It works great for that. You know, if you just need a little extra CPU and a little extra RAM because you got a few people playing on this, this costs less than most of the hosted Minecraft services. And I get full management of the box. I get complete top to bottom backups. Everything is under my control, and I know that my kids are playing on somewhere safe. So th- I, there's. I also use DigitalOcean for BitTorrent sync. I use them for own cloud. I use them for FTP file transfer. I use them to seed torrents of the distributions I am downloading. Man, I I, I use I use I use BitTorrent syncs to distribute files to all of our unfiltered supporter shows using droplets that I have in different positions around the world. I mean, it is really easy to mix and match different solutions using DigitalOcean with their different pricing options. And they have operating systems running from FreeBSD, CentOS, Fedora, Ubuntu, uh, CoreOS, Debian, all of that's up there. And uh, you can also check out their awesome community section where they have really, really good tutorials and guides to take advantage of your systems up on DigitalOcean. Go check them out, like how to use MyTop to monitor MySQL performance. That's a killer one. How to protect an Nginx server with fail to ban on Ubuntu 14.04. There's another good one. How to set up password authentication on Nginx on Ubuntu 14.04. Head over to DigitalOcean.com and use our promo code SNAPOcean. Get a $10 credit and try out DigitalOcean. See why 500,000 developers have deployed on DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code SNAPOcean. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the TechSnap program. Alan, as uh, cybersecurity becomes more of a buzzword and uh, InfoSec becomes something that every company is going to have to invest in, this mm-hmm. next story makes me cringe. I hate insurance companies, Alan. So when this headline says how insurance companies will take over InfoSec, I kind of want to die a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and it, we kind of argue uh, the article kind of goes back and forth on both sides. Uh, although its biggest point is actually how this will change the job side of it a lot. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, so they yeah. say the, the biggest thing is that insurance is a uh, maturity indicator, right? A, 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 a type of business or whatever is hmm. mature um, once insurance companies are willing to get involved, right? Okay. Uh, you know, when, it, uh, when insurance comes full scale to the InfoSec industry, maybe at that point it means we finally have gotten to the point where we understand the risks enough to start betting money on it, right? It, you know, mm. currently, I don't think anybody, any insurance company, would be willing to sell me insurance against being attacked. Uh, but as we understand it more and know exactly what the risks are, maybe it will become the point. So maybe we won't see insurance until we got to the point where we actually know enough of what's going on, where we actually have a little more control over. It. Right. This is interesting. Uh, this makes sense. Yeah. And while I can definitely see the argument that insurance companies are in a position to force their clients to uh, implement a certain minimum level of like security practices. Um, otherwise, they just don't get insurance or, we'll have, uh, or you know, we'll get a ridiculously higher rate if they don't you know, implement certain security practices. You know, like if you uh, don't hash people's passwords correctly, then your insurance price will be a lot more or they'll just say, sorry, we're not going to insure you until you fix your password hashing. Right? That would be a, a positive force. I agree. But it could also go totally wrong. Yeah, I think so. You know, at the same time, I foresee a bunch of useless certifications, extra bureaucracy, and audits like PCI DSS mm-hmm. that are basically entirely pointless. And eventually laws. Yeah. Uh, and it just it seems like this could do more harm than good at the same time. Uh, you know, People see insurance entering into security as a bad thing. Uh, maybe it is, uh, but maybe it shouldn't be unexpected. You know, if something involves both risk and significant quantities of money, there are likely people trying to buy or sell insurance around it. You know, the car industry can be informative as an example here, just as healthcare and countless other industries. Uh, but the article points out specifically the three basic requirements for an insurance company to be interested. 
is A, there must be significant risk associated with the space, i.e. dying in surgery or getting into a car crash mm-hmm. or having your, whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, there has to be enough risk that they're willing to get involved in the first place. B, there must be adequate money in the form of a population able to pay premiums. Right? Insurance only works if you're getting paid by so many people that right. when somebody yes. does get in a car wreck, yeah. you can pay for that and not lose money. Importantly, the other thing is you need sufficient actuarial data to actually decide what the level of risk is and how to price and pay out, right? So you need to know how much you need to charge to be able to, you know, say, all right, there's a X percent of our clients are going to get hacked this year and we will have to pay out this much money. Mm -hmm. So we need to price our premiums so that, you know, we will make more than that amount of money. Right. But also that the people that are more at risk pay more money Mm -hmm. Uh, and things like that. Um, But I don't know if that quite... I don't, we definitely don't have that yet. And I don't know if it's possible yeah. to measure be like, well, you have this firewall, mm-hmm. so that means that you have less chance of getting hacked. That could be right? a mess, too. Exactly. Because the technology industry moves faster than the insurance industry. Yeah. So it's, I don't know that the last measure makes sense. You know, unlike the car insurance industry, it is much harder to predict what a company's chance of getting breached are. Right? If you consider factors like how high profile they are, you know, that's like you know, fancier cars, like a Porsche was more likely to get stolen. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, well, what infrastructure they use? Well, newer cars uh, have cheaper insurance because they have higher crash test ratings, right? Correct. There's less chance of you getting hurt and needing to collect money from the insurance company for the rest of your life or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you get into things like, well, how often do they patch? Well, that's kind of a very subjective measure. And, you know, it's very hard to measure that properly. And, yeah. you know, companies can claim to have one policy, but what they actually do is something else. Well, yeah. And it basically comes down to like your car insurance um, being affected by how often you service your car, which I don't know any car insurance company that does that now, right? So it's because that'd be really hard to manage and measure. And, you know, I can see a whole business around like fake maintenance on your car just to get the cheaper insurance or whatever. Right? Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah, people will find later. a way to scam it. They always yeah. do. Uh, so that doesn't really give you enough information in order to actually price this insurance. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the end, pretty much every company has a 100% chance of being breached. Right? It's just a matter of when. Uh, so then maybe it comes down to how quickly it can be detected and how much damage is actually being done. Right? Because getting breached isn't so bad if you find it right away and stop them from getting away with anything. Right? Then you don't get an insurance payout or whatever. Yeah. Uh, oh, you know, that's creepy and twisted. Yeah. Well, no, that's... It'd be like, you know, if you got a car in a car accident but didn't get hurt, I guess maybe they pay for your car, but you don't have any medical bills. To oh, I see up, what you're right? saying. Okay, I was thinking you're saying they would allow the hack so they could get a payout. No, no, no. Okay, Sorry. okay, okay. Um, but yes, there's... In, cyber insurance fraud. I can see that happening as well. Exactly. Um, but at this point, I don't think the insurance industry is qualified to actually decide stuff about cybersecurity because I don't even know if you know the cybersecurity industry really has enough of the information to do it. Uh, so either we'll see them making uh, so many payouts that they're losing money or writing loopholes and vague things into the insurance so that they can weasel out of having to pay. Right, like nation right? state like, or something like or, that. Yeah if, if, yeah, if there's any chance it could be attributed to a nation state, no payout. Or, you know... Um, you didn't file indu- or follow industry standard security practices because you know you didn't apply this one patch or In something. In fact, didn't we and suspect that Sony actually is getting some sort of special treatment because it's a nation state attack and not an insider job? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was there was another one. Somebody getting insurance for something, but yeah, Target uh, probably. I don't know. Yeah, there was some. There was one where a company got denied the insurance because they didn't do something. Uh, but the the clause in the insurance was vague enough that you could really consider it to be true or false at any mm-hmm, time. Mm-hmm. Or you could, you could audit any company and say it was perfectly fine and the next day a, a different auditor would say no, it's not. And both of them would be perfectly reasonable. Uh, so from the article, they have a number of predictions. The first one is uh, insurance companies will have strict InfoSec standards that will be used to determine how much insurance of what type uh, they'll extend to a customer as well as how much they will charge for it kind of expect that, although I don't know how you can measure some of those things. Not uh, as, you would expect, that. Yep. as you would expect, companies uh, who are deemed to be in poor security health will pay an exorbitant premium or will be ineligible for coverage altogether. 
But uh, in this world, auditors will become the center of the InfoSec universe, uh, either working for the insurance companies themselves or as private contractors hired by insurance companies or being hired by the company to and then give it to the insurance or whatever. Uh, these auditors will be paid uh, to thoroughly assess companies' security posture in order to determine what coverage they'll be eligible for and how much it will cost. Uh, so, you know, bribing your auditor will definitely be a thing. Um, Insurance companies become, in other words, a dedicated entity that uses evidence-based decision-making to incentivize improving security, which is what we hope is the good thing. The problem is they will do it wrong. You know, for both internal and audit companies, um, we're going to see all these certifications, and the certification will have to be maintained in some way, kind of like medical professionals, right? Mm -hmm. uh, not like a CISSP where, you know, you lose your credentials and you don't renew it. It'll be like a nurse where if... You're not certified, you're fired. Right. right, and you have to keep getting recertified. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you think about it, it is not really insurance that makes this happen. It's just the industry becoming more mature. It's InfoSec becoming just like any other serious profession, yeah. like, say nurses or doctors or whatever. Uh, you know, think about a hospital or an architecture firm. You can't hire nurses just because they have an aptitude for caring or because they helped this one guy at one time. Uh, no, you know, they have to have credentials and it can't work there, you know, uh, same with accountants and architects and electricians and civil engineers, right? If you don't have the right stuff, you're fired. Uh, or just not hired at all. But yeah, uh, you know, insurance won't fix everything, or <laughs> worse, might not fix anything. You know, there's... But, you know, the biggest impact would likely be on, you know, getting a job because all of a sudden you're going to need all these silly certifications that are vague and goofy. Yeah. You know, oh. they say, yeah. Yeah, I, I, this this kind of puts a chill in me because it seems pretty obvious that we'd eventually end up here. Because we already uh, kind of see it a little bit now. Mm -hmm. Well, a, if you're a regular business, you'll have to have certified people working in approved roles, kind of like a manufacturing job. You won't be able to just have whoever working on whatever job. Right. Because <clears throat> all of a sudden, you know, you have to have a certified network engineer, firewall expert or something, and then all these other roles, and all of a sudden, you know, you can't just have, you know, two IT guys that just do everything. You will have to have somebody certified that does this, somebody certified does that, and then this just sounds like you, everybody will end up having to to uh, contract out to security firms to do everything, mm -hmm. and I think that will end up being worse, not better. I agree. You know, I understand that you know a lot of companies have you know the IT guy that's not that good, and he's or you know he's just. We've talked about it before where it's like some guy that works there that happens to just know a bit about computers and gets sucked into being the IT guy. You know, that won't be good enough, but at the same time. Uh, you know, I know lots of people that are really good at security that don't have any certifications or whatever yeah. and wouldn't be interested in bothering with them. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. And, you know, you wouldn't want to lose that on their expertise just because they don't have a piece of paper. Right, exactly. I didn't I didn't get any certifications. Well, actually, I had some, but not really in security when I was doing uh, pen testing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. there you go. But they say, uh, we also need to accept that the standardization uh, and insurance companies won't fix anything, right? Auditors make mistakes. Mm -hmm. We've seen a company get their PCI DSS certification renewed, and then the next day announce that, oh, Turns out we've been hacked for months, and it was ongoing while we were being audited, and the auditors <laughs> didn't notice. Yeah. Uh, but also, companies can and will successfully lie about their controls or uh, their process or whatever. And certifications only get you so far, and the insurance companies have their own interests that are often in conflict with the goals of actually increasing security. Right? They just want to avoid paying out, not actually increasing security. That's true. Yep. Okay, Mr. Judy, any thoughts? Nope, that's about it. Let me tell you about Ting. Go to techsnap.ting.com. It's my mobile service provider for more than two years now. A lot of the people here at Jupiter Broadcasting, I think almost everybody's on Ting. I might be missing one or two people. And it's awesome. Like when we go to conferences and stuff, Ting is always rocking because we have CDMA and GSM networks to choose from. Everybody's got like different phones. Like Noah has a couple of total like bare bones feature phones. And then he's got yep. uh, 
well, he had the Nexus 5. He just murdered the Nexus 5. Uh, it died on him. But he's got a couple phones on, on Ting that he's able to switch between depending on what he's doing. So, like, when he comes out here, he brings one smartphone with him and an emergency bat phone that his family can get a hold of him. I have a couple of different phones that I have used for testing over the years, so that way I can try something out on iOS and try something out on Android, get the latest updates. I find it great for reviews. But a lot of people like Ting just because it's an incredible value. It's only $6 a month for your line. And then any taxes that your state charges. And then it's just the usage on top of that. So what Ting does is they take your minutes, your messages, and your megabytes, and they add it all up. And whatever you bucket you fall into, that's just what you pay. It's really simple. In fact, you can kind of get an idea of how much you're going to save by going to techsnap.ting.com and then clicking on their savings calculator. Now, remember, Ting's got no contracts. So you're not going to get an early termination fee if something doesn't work out. They have no whole customer service. If you bump into any problems, they're going to be able to help you out. So just go put your actual like uh, previous usage from a bill in there and uh, just see how much it would cost you or how much you would save. Just see what it would be. See what they, if, if it maybe doesn't save you much. And then you know it's not for you. And that's perfectly fine. And maybe it'll save you $2,000 in two years like it does for me. It was yeah. an amazing difference. So it just really depends on your usage. That's why you can plug it in there. I really like that. And it, there's a couple of something we've been following on the TechSnap program. There's something Ting's doing that I'm really excited about uh, because Ting is owned by two cows. And... I really like Two Cows as a company. They've been around a long time, and I'm really, really excited that they're taking the Ting philosophy of wireless and they're applying it to gigabit Ethernet. And it's also a really good demonstration of how Ting doesn't go halfway on anything. Once Ting decides to do something, they go all the way in. And this clip updates us on that fiber initiative. So David asks, um, for the Ting internet service, would we ever consider an option between Gigabit and the 5.5 options that we currently offer? Uh, it's a question that we get a lot, and it's something that we talked a lot about internally when we were first launching the product. And we really decided we wanted to make sure people were able to experience the power of a gig and see all that a gig could really be as a service. So as a result, we decided that we were really going to focus on the Gigabit option. Uh, we also introduced a 5.5 option on the other end of the spectrum uh, for people who maybe didn't feel like they wanted to go all in with a gig but still wanted uh, a serviceable internet option that also allowed them to get away from their current provider if they weren't really having a great experience. And so with the 5.5 option, people can get on board, try it out, uh, and then ideally move up to a gig when they see just how great the service can be. That's nice. There you go. Go to techsnap.ting.com to learn more about Ting. They're, they're, uh, they are really mobile, that makes sense. It's so nice to finally have something with no contracts, no other termination fee, $6 a line, CDMA or GSM networks to choose from, an amazing dashboard, no hold customer service, and of course, hotspot tethering, no crazy line items on your bill. Check them out. Go to techsnap.ting.com, and if you're in the area, you can get their 5 over 5 internet service, or even their gigabit service. Oh my gosh. Techsnap.ting.com, and a big thanks to Ting for sponsoring the TechSnap program. Now, Alan, our good friends, our buddies over at the NSA, uh, they're always watching. <laughs> I know they're always watching the latest encryption standards, and uh, uh, they're probably ahead of the curve. Get it? The curve. Get it. Uh, <laughs> so, tell us what's going on, Alan. Uh, so, the NSA, in its role as the organization that actually sets crypt uh, cryptographic standards for use by the rest of the U.S. government, uh, has updated the recommendations on what algorithms and key sizes in, in cyber suites and so on you should use. Uh, so currently, the Suite B cryptographic algorithms are specified by the uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and then uh, are used by NSA's Information Assurance Directorate to uh, develop solutions approved for protecting classified and unclassified national security systems. So basically, uh, they have a big table that tells you what uh, the minimum level of encryption or whatever type stuff uh, you would use on different documents based on whether it's you know secret or top secret or whatever. Uh, so they recently updated those. So we have uh, the archive.org look of what the page looked like uh, a month ago and what <laughs> it looks like today. Okay. Uh, and we've covered when they updated it before, when they increased the mm -hmm. you know when they ratcheted up your RSA keys should be twenty forty eight instead of less. Um, so some of the big changes that they made were. Um, AES-128 has been dropped entirely. Mm. Instead of having separate levels for secret and top secret, they just recommend AES-256 for everything now. Um, the elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman and elliptic curve DSA have moved uh, from the P-256 curve to the uh, P-384 curve. Uh, so even for your less secret information, you should use the stronger stuff. Okay. 
Uh, they also dropped uh, SHA-256 in favor of uh, SHA-384, which was slightly surprising because I kind of assumed everything would just go to SHA-512. Mm-hmm. Uh, 384 is not one you see very often, mm-hmm. honestly. Uh, and then uh, additionally, they added some new requirements, so uh, a whole net- set of rows that are in the table that weren't in the old table. Oh. Um, Diffie-Hellman key exchanges now need to be at least uh, 3072-bit, mm. um, which is, you know, 1024 plus half. Um, that's partly, that goes back to the logjam stuff uh, and things like that. And then uh, for RSA keys, for key establishment, or for digital signatures, they also now require uh, 3072-bit. Uh, so this suggests that everybody should be using at least uh, 3072-bit for SSL certificates, um, you know, your SSH keys, anything like that. Okay. Uh, although you're perfectly fine to go straight to 4098-bit or whatever, or 4096. Uh, but anyway, uh, it spells out basically the requirements of what the U.S. government is going to use, so you probably want your requirements to be at least that strong. Right, uh, and right, then that's they, good Yeah, and then they uh, added a whole bunch of new stuff to the, uh, the document. They say the uh, IAD will uh, initiate a transition to quantum-resistant algorithms Hey-o. in the not-too-distant future. Really? It's like, as soon as there are some. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, based on experience in uh, deploying Suite B, we have determined to start uh, planning and communicating early about the upcoming transition to quantum-resistant algorithms so that we have lots of time to do that. And they say they're working with partners across the U.S. government, uh, vendors, and uh, standards bodies to ensure there's a clear plan for getting... Uh, the new set of algorithms that are deployed uh, in an open and transparent manner that will form the foundation of the next suite of uh, cryptographic algorithms. So, in, in other words, the NSA is beginning to worry about quantum encryption, and they're beginning yes. to think about it in and, like a uh, serious way. Yeah, and uh, you know, they're basically going to NIST will probably start soliciting and trying to do their the same thing they did for AES two fifty six on deciding what the next set of uh, algorithms should be, and you know, there will be challenges and prizes mm. and hmm. yeah. Uh, uh, until the new suite is developed and products are available to implement these quantum resistant uh, encryption suites that rely on the current algorithms. Uh, they say, with respect to IAD customers using large unclassified PKA systems, uh, anything remaining at 112 bits of security, which uh, such as 2048 bit RSA, uh, may be preferable or sometimes necessary due to budget constraints. I don't think so. Like, very often is the crypto the real bottleneck. Yeah, right. Like, but, like I can, crypto can't use up a lot of CPU, but if you're running to the point where your CPU is already like at 100%, then you should just get a bigger CPU uh, mm-hmm. rather than be like, well, we should just use less encryption. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyways, uh, for near-term anticipatory uh, stuff, it's like you might want to avoid upgrading to stronger RSA uh, because we hope to just replace it with the quantum-resistant asymmetric algorithms as soon as they're available. But, you know, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary solution. So, yes, everybody should switch to, like, 4090-bit RSA, or 4096-bit RSA to make sure they're at least getting uh, quite a bit more bits of security. Yeah. That's interesting. That's a sign of the times, Alan. It's yeah. uh, um, it's not a bad idea to rotate your keys every once in a while anyway, so well, yeah. might, when yeah. you're, if you're going to rotate them anyway, you might as well beef them up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Huh. Well, look at the NSA. You know, I have a couple servers that are so old, the keys are probably not that big. I wonder if people realize, I mean, we all, I mean, the NSA has a whole different, you know, uh, uh, Yeah, but part of the NSA's job is actually to provide security for the U.S. government. And, I, I, you know, they do this in a surprisingly open... Yeah, like they publish a, a big document on, like, how to lock down your Windows XP computer. <laughs> yeah. I, we, I, they've updated yeah. for Windows 7, I'm sure, but... Yeah. Yeah. That, We've actually covered it on the show before, mm-hmm. back when the NSA wasn't quite such a bad guy. Mm-hmm. Um, that, you know, they do, you know, or, uh, we covered the Australian version of the NSA. Remember they had that big document of all the things you can do? Mm. And if, if we just did the top four, if everybody just did the top four off the list, it, we would have, uh, mm-hmm. you know, 90% of all breaches wouldn't have happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Huh. Uh, so the information that Alan just uh, mentioned and the details are all laid out right in the show notes. So if there was if if you missed some of the finer points, don't worry. Alan has pulled them out and stashed them in the show notes. Just go to jupiterbroadcasting.com, look for episode 230 and scroll down past the download links and you'll find links to all this stuff. Anything else in that story, Alan? Uh, nope, that's it for that one. All right, well then I'll tell you about our friends over at IX Systems. Alan, you know about them. ixsystems.com/techsnap 
can find the ultimate guide to buying a new server for open source over there. And iX Systems can create a system for just about any size business. Real big solutions and, and solutions for a small land. Go check them out. They have enterprise storage powered by open source. And Alan, I believe you sent me some additional pictures of your I recent did. machine. And um, I got to say, Alan, this is looking pretty fancy. I'm pulling them up yep. right now. They're huge okay. pictures. Huge pictures. Uh, see, I right shrunk there. them before I sent them to you. They were 20 megabytes. <laughs> all right. So uh, what? tell me about this uh, first. Oh, boy. Look at all that disk. Yes. Look uh, at so all So this that. is these are the two that went to uh, mm. my basement. They have uh, 24 <laughs> 5 terabyte uh, SATA disks each. Okay. okay. Wow. And you can see iX's new logo in the corner. Yes. There. It's looking really slick. That's the first time I've seen it on a piece of hardware, actually. Yeah. Uh, that's the inside. There's the air channel, the flow channel, whatever you call it. Yep. The air shroud. Yeah, air shroud. And uh, in this one, you can see it has three of the um, HBAs or mm -hmm. host bus adapters. Mm -hmm. That's where the, the drive controllers. Yeah, the third one's at that's the bottom. Because, uh, yeah, each, uh, there's two connectors in each one. Each of those connectors fans out to four SATA uh, cables. So that gives me 8 plus 8 plus 8 is 24 drives. So I didn't have to use any expanders or anything, so there's less chance of complications by the fact that I cheaped out and used SATA drives in this build. <laughs> uh, so once all ZFS is up, uh, this machine, each of these two machines will hold 100 terabytes. Wow. Uh, and they're backing, or maybe it's 90. Anyway, uh, they're backing up a bigger machine that we showed pictures of a couple weeks ago that has 36 6 terabyte helium SAS drives in it mm -hmm. with multipath. And so that's where I did all the high availability and spent all the money. These are just the backup machines for that. Uh, so uh, with the help of IX, I cut a couple of corners. Nice. Nice. And what are we looking at? Is this a... Uh... This is the back of the back plane that the drives connect to. Um, when we were showing off the pictures the other week, oh, somebody yeah, yeah. asked for specifically how this worked. Okay. So uh, you saw all the hot swap bays in the front. Yeah. And they slot in. You can kind of see them a little bit in the top of the picture there. And then those um, uh, SAS cables connect in there and fan out to the individual SATA ports. Okay. And then you can't see it in the picture, but power also plugs in mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And uh, something you might not have noticed is that all the fans are actually hot swappable. I like They're that. They're in a plastic thing, and you just pinch and pull it out, and it disconnects the power, and then you can hot swap the fans. So if a fan dies, you can hot swap it uh, without having to turn the machine off. Yeah, this picture kind of illustrates that pretty well. Yep. You can see that uh, little and then the, Yes, uh, here's uh, Andrew and I. Uh, you can see Andrew's holding. We're installing a dual-ported 10-gig NIC into the server. Uh, nice. Some NICs I already had uh, that were in smaller machines that couldn't quite saturate the 10 gigs is nice, uh, but these machines will definitely not have that problem. And then our last but not least, there it is from the front with all yes, of the Here's things. me uh, popping all the hot swap bays out so we can fill them with hard drives. That's awesome. <laughs> that must have been fun. Pop, 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 pop. <laughs> yep. Um, you know, the, the bigger machine we bought because we bought the hard drives from IX, uh, they did it all for us, right? So mm -hmm. on, on top of the better warranty and everything, they took the drives out of the static bag, put them into the caddies, put it back in the static bag, put them in their super nice shipping container they do, uh, and ship them with the server. Uh, separate so that the drives aren't in the server, which does two things. A, it's uh, this way. There's each drive surrounded by a bunch of foam, so the less chance of it getting shocked during shipping. And B, it means you can lift the server and put it in the rack yes. without all the weight of the hard drive. That's in. very true. Uh, that makes a big difference. Thirty-six hard drives weighs quite a bit. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. You might also get a chance to say hi to the IX Systems folks over at VBSDCon. That's where Alan's going to yes. be. They, they usually I'll be, be speaking there. there about ZFS, actually. There you go. There you go. So maybe you can find out more in person or check them out at ixsystems.com slash techsnap. And a big, big thank you to IX Systems for sponsoring. Yes, but uh, check out VBSDCon, especially if you're, you know, uh, U.S. East Coast, like Virginia area, Washington, D.C., whatever. Uh, and if you're coming, bring your copy of your ZFS book and I will autograph it. Nice. Good thinking. Yeah, check it out. You can find out more. Uh, we'll have, uh, I guess we'll put a link to it in the show notes because the URL yeah. is kind of crazy. It's like well, if you just, it's vbsdcon.com oh, okay. and it forwards to that. Aha, uh -huh. okay, okay, there you go, vbsdcon. But yes, uh, there's uh, a dinner on the Friday, uh, along with the FreeBSD Developer Summit. I see that. Whatever. But uh, the Saturday and Sunday are full of uh, kind of a, a hybrid unconference. So there's uh, regular talks, but only a single track instead of many tracks, like a BSD can. So you won't have to pick and choose what to watch. Uh, but there's also uh, unconference stuff, like there will be a Birds of a Feather session mm -hmm. and like speed geeking and a bunch of other interesting stuff. Very cool. It's, uh, it was a really good conference uh, two years ago when they ran it for the first time. Uh, and so I'm expecting great things this year. Very nice. Check it out, vbsdcon.com, and go say hi to Alan and the folks at IX Systems. <laughs> all right. Very good, Mr. Jude. So with the news all done, that means it's time for the TechSnap Feedback.
Thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or click on that contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting website or even better, starting to thread in our subreddit over at techsnap.reddit.com. Our first email today comes in from David. He says, hi, I have an open media vault box running as my NAS in a five drive chassis for our hot swappable with an Atom N330 and two gigabytes of RAM. It has a small 40 gigabit drive for the OS and two two terabyte drives for data storage in a software RAID 1. One of the storage drives is dying, and I ordered two four terabyte drives as replacements and upgrades. I'm wondering, what would be the best way to use the still good two terabyte drive and the two new four terabyte drives to maximize available space while maintaining resilience to drive loss? Is there any way to get a drobo like experience where a file system will grow progressively as I add newer or bigger drives to the system? Would ZFS on Linux provide the solution I'm looking for? Would it be advisable to run it with an Atom N330 with 2 gigabytes of RAM? Or should I instead look at running it with a RAID 5 setup with different size drives and grow the LVM when I need to add new drives? Thanks for the great show. Keep up the good work. David, or a.k.a. Debrass. Your thoughts, Alan? Yeah, um, I don't like the whole... There are cheats you could do. Like, you could try to take the 4 terabyte drive and divide it into two 2 terabyte partitions. Mm. And then you have four of those off the 4 terabyte drives plus one more off the existing 2 terabyte drive. Um... But you would have to do something like at least RAID Z2 mm. or RAID 6 so that because if that one of those two 4 terabyte drives dies, it's going to take out two of your virtual disks. So you have to be able to withstand that. And it just gets all kinds of horrible. Um, so yes, either just do it as a regular Z1 or whatever of three 2 terabyte drives. Uh, you know, the extra space on the 4 terabyte drive is just ignored temporarily. Yeah. And then later on, if you replace that 2 terabyte with another 4 terabyte, then all of a sudden it can grow to be 3 4 terabyte drives. Hmm. Um, and if he does that currently, I guess, what was he doing now? Mirrors? He yeah, said he had a software. He said he had a drives in a RAID Z1, but that doesn't make any he sense. He said he had a software RAID 1, yeah. Oh, sorry, RAID 1 is mirrors. Yes, okay. So he was doing mirroring. Yep. Uh, so currently he had 2 terabytes of storage. If he switches to having the 2 terabyte drive and 2 4 terabyte drives in like a RAID Z, uh, RAID 5 setup, or RAID Z1, then he would have 4 terabytes of space usable plus the redundancy, so he would actually be getting more space and be happy. Um, so yeah, you could do that. Yeah, there you go. All right. Um, but yeah, the Drobo-like experience is really complicated and it doesn't work that great. Robos are horrible. Okay, there you go. Skooky Sprite writes in. Uh, he says, yo, Chris and Dark Lord Jude. So, <laughs> I know that you've talked about this over the last several years on several shows with their varying degrees of quality results, but now this finally has come home to hit me. And he says, considering that we're the ultimate masters, he thought he would bring it to us. Simply put, I need a way to record the audio from Skype or some Skype-like application provided that it runs cross-platform and is super easy. Uh, uh, Omega nom caliber easy for the other people I plan to record and splits each participant into their own track so I can mix them independently. I'm not adverse to paying for this type of functionality. Of course, I'd prefer some sort of open source solution, but in reality, uh, I'm making a documentary and I can't record what people say. To give you a glimpse of where I'm at, I'm stuck in the dark ages. Currently, my best solution involves running a Skype across several computers for each one of the people in the conversation I want to record, recording the convo locally on each machine and running them. In, well, that actually isn't a bad solution, really. And running them out the mixer so I can hear what, they, what the hell they're saying and then splitting my mic into the audio in of each machine. Yeah, that's pretty nuts. So what is the current state of art in accomplishing this goal? Uh, software well, I can describe ideas. what we do for BSD now, Go ahead. which is a hardware solution. So hey. I have a, a little USB sound card uh, that I plug into the NUC, and uh, it provides an output of, and, and I run Skype on the NUC. And so when Chris and optionally the guests, when they're both in a, we do a Skype group call, uh, are talking, then that feeds into my headphones. Um, and then I use the desktop presenter software from Wirecast to also bring a copy of that into Wirecast. Um, then off my microphone here, uh, there's a monitor port right here uh, that you normally would plug headphones in just to check your own levels or whatever. I can't work while I can hear myself. So I run. I have a, just a regular audio patch cable that I run from this monitor port into the microphone jack on that little USB <laughs> sound card. So the USB connection out of my mic here goes into my computer, which is running Wirecast, and then the analog patch cable runs into and pretends to be a mic on the NUC so the people on Skype can hear me. Uh, the downside to this is that there's more latency in the software capture that comes into Wirecast. So I hear Chris in real time, 
but the version of Chris that goes into Wirecast is delayed. And this has caused the problem of me talking over top of him sometimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, because in my ears, he stopped talking. Right. But in, yeah. the, in the captured version, he hasn't actually finished yet because it's like two seconds off or half a second off. Yeah, or it's just enough. Uh, um, yeah. But we don't actually get separate tracks for that. Yeah, and see, and you're doing video, and so when you record audio separately from video, that thing you have to match that up, and it's a monster. If it's, that's why we use Desktop Presenter to record the audio and the video in together. software yeah. together. Yep. Um, now, if he's doing audio only, I do have a secret weapon that I haven't told many people about because I'm planning to use it myself, and I think it's going to make my stuff sound better than everybody else's. So if you're doing audio production only, I, I'll tell you about Zencaster. Z e n c a s t r dot com, and it uses WebRTC. Now you have to use something to make the calls, so you have to use Skype or Hangouts or Mumble or whatever you want to use to make the calls. But what what this it does? It's a WebRTC application that basically makes a copy hijack of the user's local microphone, and then it records it to a 128 kilobit MP3 file and saves it to your Dropbox. So each participant in the Zencast has a local MP3 file created. They get to download the version of them of it for themselves in case Dropbox doesn't work or they want a local copy. It prompts them at the end of the session if they'd like to have their own local copy of the recording. And then at the same time, it also uploads it to your Dropbox. So you got three people in a Zencaster call. You'll get three independent tracks and your own track, a fourth track of the audio saved to your Dropbox. You bring that into your editor. You bring them all together. You're done. I'm not super happy with the encoding quality at this point, so I'm waiting for them to work some of those things out. But it's very easy to use once you create an account. You just send them a link. They come in. It shows them a waveform so they can figure out if it's capturing their microphone correctly or not. So there's a nice visual for it. And then when you start recording, it gives them a notification and it saves it all right back to Dropbizzle. This, I think, is going to be huge for audio podcasters because it essentially automates the double-ended recording. It's the secret sauce of sounding good for a remote interview. And I think it's going to be a breakthrough way to record podcasts if they don't go under because they're just you know a startup that's making a WebRTC app and some beta right now. And, and because they're not charging you for the storage or something, they're just using Dropbox. Yep, yep. And you just need to have, like, <coughs> Chrome or Firefox or something like that to, uh, to make it work. And I love it. Also, uh, Mr. S- Mr. Cam in the chat room points out, of course, you could use free PBX. And Skooky Sprite, that might be something up your alley, is you could use free PBX and record the calls that way as well. So that's something to consider. Good luck, yeah. Skooky Sprite. All right. Uh, uh, I looked at somebody had ported Pulse Audio to Windows, and I thought that might be a way to pull and push like push my mic out to multiple computers and pull Ooh. the sound in from multiple computers. Ooh. But no, mm-hmm. uh, it just, it wasn't workable. Um, so, I don't know. Cause I was, yeah. Cause at one point I, I had it down where it was, all right, I'll have a separate computer, one computer with Skype on it for call to Chris and one for the guest. But then it was like, well, how do Chris and the guest hear each other? Mm-hmm. You got to eat at that point. You'd have to have a mixer with a mix minus and yeah. yeah. And like huge, like a giant freaking board with, all the makes it way more complicated. If, if we're going to have two guests and me and Chris, and we're all in separate places, and all it just, oh my God, my brain explodes. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. Mm-hmm. If you're recording multiple people in person, they make a, a beefier version of my Zoom H1 yes. that does multi track recording. That's yes, very nice. Um, all right. Although the solution he's come up with is basically how you have to kind of do it at scale if you're, make, if you're a podcast yep. network. All right. So Corey writes in, he wants something solved once and for all. He says, hey, Alan and Chris, something I've always wondered. How can someone take a website that, uh, that they don't own and then inject JavaScript into it and force people to download whatever it is they've injected? Like, how do hackers get something trustful to download and run malware without access to the original website? Love the show. Cheers. Corey. There's a couple different ones. Uh, with the regular like, code injection type thing, if, for example, a website has a comments box, you can type whatever you want in the comment. Well, if you type HTML into the comment, and when somebody views the comment, it'll run the HTML code. Uh, now, most comment systems have protection against this, and they you know, don't let you inject HTML. Uh, but some of them, there's a bug or whatever, and it po- allows you to basically, by sending something to the website, cause it to, or including something in the URL or whatever, cause it to run some code on everybody that views the site. The other one is when you actually hack the website, and you can just change the code to inject an iframe or whatever. Uh, that one happens a lot with like WordPress. Uh, you'll see where it just changes one of the WordPress files on the hard drive of the server to include the, uh, the iframe that points to the malicious stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, you can uh, do, there are JavaScript examples where it's like, here's some JavaScript code. If you go paste this into the, uh, the comment box or some other box on a website, and 
if the website doesn't sanitize it properly before it prints it back to you, then the JavaScript will run every time you load the page. Yeah. Yep. Okay. John writes in with a VPN and Tails question. He says, hey, Chris and Alan, I wanted to set up a VPN and then use Tails. Unfortunately, this is not a recommended setup by the Tails website. I understand that once you log into a VPN, I understand that you log, in, you log into a VPN. But I do not understand how this can compromise my anonymity. Is there a secure way to hide your origin? If so, how do I accomplish this? Love the show, John. So logging into the VPN hides uh, and then routing your traffic through it can some, uh, doesn't necessarily hide you because if you're paying for the VPN, they have records that tie back to your credit card, which tie back yeah. to your address. And that VPN has and a so, fixed out point, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, it also, yeah, it has a fixed out point where oftentimes it's uh, fairly obvious that it is a VPN. Mm -hmm. And so it can actually make you more uh, obvious that you're somebody trying to hide because you're using a VPN than if you just came from some random Comcast address. Yeah. And if your VPN is always coming out at the same point and then you're jumping onto yep. Tor, they can kind of figure out it's you. So you're exactly. going on the Tor network to sort of distribute your traffic all around and not be traceable, and a VPN is essentially... But yeah, in the end, because you're paying for a VPN and because you're always connecting to the VPN from your home IP, right. it's not actually going to help you that much. Yeah, you don't... And do you really need yeah. it if you're doing Tor? V VPNs were designed to allow you to, you know, to tunnel to the office, the, yeah. the network at work, not to hide who you are. Right, it's more about it's not intercepting the traffic in between two points. Yeah, it's, it's just a tunnel to keep the traffic invisible in between the two points, but if you don't trust the point at the other end, the VPN service, because it could be somebody else, uh, or it's, it's owned by somebody else, and they can do whatever they want with your traffic, it's not actually helping you at all. It's I actually possibly just aggregating all the people that are trying to do yeah. something they shouldn't uh, in one place and make it easier for somebody to go after them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm surprised Netflix doesn't shut down more VPNs more often. And uh, well, Netflix doesn't care as long as they're getting their ten dollars a month. <laughs> now the movie companies care, and at some right. point they will try to make Netflix yeah, care. Yeah, that's yeah, uh, very true. There is, I, I don't know if we ever talked about it, but um, the like CTO of Bell Canada, which is a big phone company here, but also owns like a third of all the TV stations and newspapers and radio stations and everything. Uh, she was saying it's you know it should be morally reprehensible to admit that you use a VPN to access American Netflix instead of using Canadian Netflix or whatever. Uh, and that, you know, people shouldn't go around bragging about it. They should feel bad about it. And it's like, well, we understand that Bell has a TV service that competes with v uh, with Netflix, but it doesn't have any of the same content. That's right. That's what's so about. if I'm paying for Netflix, I'm not taking any business away from Bell Mobile TV. Right. It's because nobody wants to watch Bell Mobile TV because it doesn't have any shows that they want. <laughs> exactly. It's like maybe if you got useful content and, you know, made your service easy to use instead of, you know, tied into running up the data plan on your cell phone. Funny how that works. Uh, yeah. Then, but yeah. Anyway. I loved this spot by Humbro user. Uh, he thinks maybe some of our uh, mobile sysadmins out there might enjoy this. Uh, it is a rollable keyboard by LG. They call it's called the Rolly Keyboard KVB-700. They claim to be a full-size keyboard. We don't. He doesn't know. He can't speak for that. Uh, but check that out. They, he also noticed that the, the keyboard row for the number keys is merged into the QWERTY keys apparently. But Check yep. it out, Alan. I'm gonna wait, let me clear this full screen pop up right here. There we go. Look, it folds up into this little guy right here, and then it unfolds into nice. a. F could you, you know, on the road, I could totally see this being very useful. Like now, they, I've seen uh, I, back more than ten years ago. Even there was something like this for LAN parties, where the keyboard was made out of like a rubbery material, and you rolled it up the other way. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Uh, that is pretty this good. This definitely looks nice. Like this is something I could fold up, stick in my backpack with my laptop. Yep. And be able to pull out and use uh, when I need a full size keyboard. And the way they're showing it too is they're showing it like uh, working with uh, little clips out for like a tablet, so you could have a full size keyboard on a tablet mm -hmm. if you need to do like SSH. I love how they de they say DevelOps instead of DevOps. DevelOps. It's yeah. like they don't quite understand. They don't the the term. They know? try so hard. They try. Well, if do you know what LG actually stands for? Life is good, right? No. Oh, I thought that was what it stood for. No, that's just their slogan. Oh, okay. Okay. It's Lucky Gold Star Technologies. Really? Yes. <laughs> so I would also say life insight. is good. I would, I would, yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, there you go. That's a good piece of gear submitted to the subreddit by a Humbro user, techsnap.reddit.com. But yes, uh, I might have to get one of those. That That's kind of neat, right? Especially if you're traveling around and stuff. Yeah. Like on my, on my full-size laptop with the giant screen and the big keyboard, it's not so bad. But on the smaller like X220s, the keys feel just a tiny bit too close together. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I uh, I probably have fat fingers, but I'm I'm very used to my giant mechanical keyboard. 
Speaking of mobile, I'm going to go ahead and make a plug for our Patreon over at patreon.com slash today. I'm trying to raise some funds for the new JB1 Mobile Studio. A couple of things, I don't know, I think I could do it with or without, but one of the things I'd like to do before I hit the road is get a Wi-Fi signal booster installed and a 4G LTE signal booster. It boosts all 4G spectrums, which is awesome, and the Wi-Fi signal booster basically can pick up any open Wi-Fi network. Like, if you just have a teensy bincy bit of signal, it can boost it and rebroadcast inside the studio. Of course, the goal being here, so that way I can stream and be live while on the road. And I don't know if it's going to happen, because I think the Wi-Fi booster is about 300 and something dollars, and the LTE signal booster is about 300 and something dollars, but then you figure installation is going to be about $300 for each, and so then it could very quickly get to the $1,000 category. And then you need to power those all the time, especially yeah. on the road. Yeah, but I think it's I might like, have that solved. In- instead, you'll just only broadcast from the parking lots of Starbucks. <laughs> that could be the other way I go, and you know what? If that's what happens, that's what happens. But yep. I thought I'd make a mention, because I am trying to raise some funds over there, and then we have something really cool after the road trip. Uh, to, to announce too. So patreon.com slash today if you'd like to help me with that initiative. I actually don't think it's really going to impact the TechSnap show one way or the other. So regardless if you support it, uh, the TechSnap show will continue on, but if you'd like to help out with the other shows and keep them going, that would be very much appreciated. Patreon.com slash today. And also we need more of your emails because we're double recording next week. We got two more episodes we're going to do and we'd love to have two big, full feedback segments. Any kind of questions, mm-hmm. systems, network, administration, uh, storage, any kind of uh, war stories you want to share with us. Or like Scooby Sprite, he asked kind of an off-the-wall question that we don't normally get, but we had an answer for him because, well, we do a lot of different things. Just send them into techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or click that contact link and uh, fill it in. And we'd love to get your questions for the next two episodes that we're recording next week. And Alan, with the feedback all done this week, that means it's time for the TechSnap Roundup. Welcome to the TechSnap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the roundup for stories that just didn't quite fit at the top of the show, but we still want to talk about them and give you some links to follow up and read even more on your own after the show. A lot of these links came from our subreddit over at techsnap.reddit.com. And I wanted to pull this one up to the top of the subreddit, uh, or to the top of the um, uh, roundup, because when this story originally made the, uh, I don't know, presses originally, I, it jumped out at me that, that the components that the GCHQ were destroying of the laptops from the folks at The Guardian that had the Edward Snowden documents on it were very peculiar. Uh, they were targeting um, things like the trackpad controller. And yeah, the well, apparently, the, tr- the trackpad controller can actually hold up to two megabytes or megabits of, yes, of memory. Yes. And so it could, you know, you could hide data there so that it wouldn't. In be fact, uh, the that's the very, that's the very, um, that's the very uh, sort of theory that the Intercept is floating here. They say that the way the GCHQ obliterated the MacBooks may have revealed more than they intended. In fact, uh, they point out how the power controller they asked for, they asked for specific components to be destroyed, and then photo evidence that those individual components were destroyed. And they go on to talk about how uh, normally people would just destroy the hard drive, but the GCHQ specifically requested that these components be attacked. Like they say, the trackpad controller can hold up to two megabytes of memory, just like you were saying, and uh, they think the hidden memory storage locations could theoretically be taken advantage of, and the GCHQ likely knows how to take advantage of those locations, and they assume since they know how to do it, somebody else might know how to do it, and so destroy it. And then I started thinking, you know, these are Guardian reporters. Maybe another intelligence agency from another state is taking advantage and and putting persistent malware on there or something like that, and that's why they had those things destroyed. And they kind of showed their cards when they had to have that done in a very public way, I think. Anyways, we could go on and speculate. This article does a much better job than we could do there and talks about it. It was years ago before any of the Snowden stuff, but I remember hearing about how uh, GCHQ, when they, like, decommissioned a computer or whatever, they would take the hard drive and grind it down into, like, dust Mm -hmm. and, like, keep the sand in a little box in a vault. Yes. That seemed a little... uh, (laughs) <laughs> over Excessive, the top, but, but yeah. uh, I think part of it is just paranoia. We, we destroy everything that could be any type of storage to make sure that there's nothing left. Uh, but, you know, I don't know how much of it is because they know they can compromise it versus because they know there's some way that it could possibly contain information. Yeah, that is interesting, isn't it? It's very paranoid, too. Hey, uh, Alan, are you familiar with this immobilizer chip and uh, the uh, banned article about the immobilizer chip, which has just been published after two years? I guess it's like a chip that would go in like a family car, right? Yeah, so this is a chip uh, that Volkswagen put in their high-end cars and, and Porsches, which Volkswagen owns part of now. Um, and basically, it's like the anti-theft system or whatever. Yeah. But in 2012, some security researchers figured out uh, some problems with it, 
And when they went to publish their stuff, their paper in Usenix, the Unix uh, conference paper thing, uh, the High Court of London actually blocked them publishing it. Mm, okay. And uh, finally, uh, this month, they were allowed to publish it. <laughs> okay, and so it's out, and it's fascinating. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, but the the slash art also goes into the history of the whole argument, all about it, and so on. That's cool. Thank you for linking that. I thought this was interesting. We were talking about crypto. How about this? How about a reflective satellite, which could be the future of high-end encryption, bouncing a single photon off a satellite for flexible quantum key distribution? Yeah, quantum key distribution is regularly touted as the encryption of the future. While the keys are exchanged on an insecure channel, the laws of physics provide a guarantee that two par- parties can exchange a secret key and know if they're being overheard. This unencrypted but secure form of key exchange circumvents one potential shortcomings of some forms of public key systems. However, quantum key distribution, K, or I'm sorry, QKD, has a Which big downside. Which is just downside. impossible to say. They'll have to fix it. Yeah, yeah, right? Uh, the two parties need to have a direct link to each other. So, for instance, banks and banks in and around Geneva use dedicated fiber links to perform QKD. KD, but they can only do this because the link distance is less than 100 kilometers. These fixed and short links are ex- a very expensive solution. A more flexible solution is required if QKD is going to be used for far more general encryption purposes, and some Italian researchers have demonstrated the possibility of it being done via a satellite. They just have to have a view of the satellite, and they'd be able to do a key exchange. Interesting. Very cool. <coughs> I didn't realize that was such a uh, constraint of uh, quantum key exchange. Yep. I didn't know they were quite that far with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that either. That or that too. Uh, World Meet Thor, a project to hammer out a royalty-free video codec. Hey, look yes. at Cisco. So Cisco's hired a bunch of people that know things about video, and they're looking uh, basically to uh, step over H two six five, the successor to what we use now, H two six four, because as we talked about a couple weeks ago, you know they're starting a second patent pool and trying to be unreasonable and mm-hmm. uh, Cisco just wants something that yes. uh, can be standard and interoperable and everybody can just have video and so do the rest uh, of us you know Cisco uh, already took the step of paying the license for an H264 decoder for Firefox yep uh, for the same reason mm-hmm. so uh, it'd be very nice to actually have something that was completely unencumbered by all this crap yep. but actually worked uh, you know Google's got its thing but it's too slow <laughs> Obviously, not just Cisco's telecommunications products, but uh, WebEx and all of these also use this. And I am, uh, I am so glad it's Cisco because they're big yeah. enough, rich enough, and influential enough to maybe actually make a difference. But they don't have enough skin in the game from a commercial like um, market strategy tax position where they have to lock it down. Yeah, uh, what would be really great for them, I think, is you know if in the future you could join a WebEx as just a WebRTC and not have to download any software to use it. Yeah, man, exactly. Yeah. That would be slick. All right, if almost a condemn, uh, condemning just how bad the TSA body scanners are here in the U.S., uh, their uh, officials are now recommending that after passengers pay, pass through the body scanners, they still go through metal detectors. Uh, and if yeah, it's just such a giant waste of fraud and abuse of government money. And these things. Uh, okay, well, you every know. time I've been through a body scanner, I've never gone through a metal detector. No, no. They're, now they're recommending the, ah. post body scanner to also now add the metal metal detector because the body scanners are such crap. Yeah. And, I just, and what's the point of the body scanner again? Uh, so here, yeah, I know. The cost breakdown, which the TSA recently turned over to some members of Congress, provides the latest look at the agency's investment in body imaging technology since it decided to make the scanners the centerpiece of the checkpoint screening process. The price tag averages more than $150,000 per unit since the agency first bought a batch of 45 devices in 2008. For that money, law pay, lawmakers privy to classified reports say the TSA has gotten an, a woeful failure rate. Um, I don't know if they have the number in here, Alan. But it was something like a 90% failure rate. They had, they had uh, law enforcement agents walk through it with bombs. And yep. I don't... And knives and, and guns and all kinds of stuff. And yeah. And they didn't get caught. They didn't get stopped. Yep. Uh, I remember at one point, they were, you know, some of the body scanners were so crap, they were just like, we're just going to gift these to older airports, so like smaller airports that yeah. don't have any new gear, yeah. and they can have them, and we'll, get, we'll go back to using high, nice, good metal detectors you know, at the other airports. It's interesting. It turns out the gentleman who owns the company that sold the body scanners to the Department of Homeland Security is good friends with George Bush. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? Yeah. All right, next story uh, in the roundup. ISP's email password reset system is a guy named Sean. <laughs> like, uh, literally so, a guy named Sean? Yeah. Uh, so what's really interesting is that this is Frontier Communications in Washington State. Yeah, who, one of my, uh, my ISPs at the house, my ISP yeah, at the house. It, yeah, exactly. Uh, 
But so apparently uh, he needed to reset his password, and so he uh, called them up or whatever, and the uh, support person forwarded him to a tech person or whatever, who then just read to him his original password. In plain so they text. obviously store it in plain text. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Yikes. Yeah, his, so when you, get a, when you get a Frontier account, they just give you like an email account and nobody uses it because, you know, you kind of have to be a noob to use your ISP's email account. I'm sorry for doing that. You oh, probably shouldn't. Well, uh, actually, uh, even here, uh, so when he called them up, they were like, all right, what would you like us to set the password to? And the guy's like, well, I'm not really comfortable giving up my password over the phone. Do you have a password reset page? And Sean's like, I'm sorry, there isn't. Uh, are you okay with me just posting your current password into this chat? It's a secure network. Yeah. And I have your password in front of me. Yeah, so he asked, uh, ours contacted them and says, does Frontier store all webmail passwords in plain text? How does the company protect them, and why would customer service reps be given access to customer passwords in plain text? A Frontier customer service rep said, customer service reps don't have access. Only tech support does, and it's only revealed once the customer has provided the security code to verify the identity. Account modification logs are kept to ensure the company knows who accessed the information. In other words, a policy this is, meta is in place. Modification logs are yeah. kept to tell who accessed the information. Yeah. Because a modification log only shows who changed information. Right. And also, if the fact that customer service reps don't have access, but tech support does, that's just a security setting or even a policy setting. That's not like... Or just... That means uh, they're still unencrypted. Like, what's the difference between a, like, a customer service rep and a tech support rep? That means the data is still in the database unencrypted. Exactly. But also, it's just like... What's the difference between those two classes of people? They sit at desks side by side in a call center. <laughs> One's techie and one knows how to talk nicely to customers, I think. I don't, yeah. I, I don't know, actually. <laughs> one deals with problems with your bill and one deals with problems with your internet yeah, connection. Basically. It they're not any higher class person. But yes, importantly, they shouldn't have any access at all. Mm -hmm. What do you think of this next stat? Surveys show 81% of healthcare organizations suffered a cyber attack in a survey conducted by KPMG titled 2015 KPNG Healthcare Cybersecurity Survey, which that means it must be legit. It says 81% of healthcare organizations have been targeted and compromised by at least one botnet, malware, or other cyber attack during the past two years, according yes. to interviews they've well, done with executives. It, uh, a, a computer at a hospital got a malware that's a cyber attack, right? They, said, they mentioned like botnets. So that's if true. any computer gets infected by anything at all, well, yes, I'm surprised that's not 100%. Good it's point. like, I, I'm guessing the other 19% are lying. <laughs> Some secretary at every hospital has gotten, an, is opened an attachment, I'm sure. Yeah, 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 you're right. You're so right. the other 19% are either lying or just don't know that that's happened. You're right, Alan. You're right, Alan. All right, Raspberry so Pi. We have to, like, change the definitions to actually measure something useful. Well, and it, it's, well... It seems pretty obvious. It almost seems like you'd be using that if you wanted to inflate the numbers. Like, you know, yeah, it's like a hundred percent of people have been rained on, but only you know point zero 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 one percent of people have been struck by lightning. Yeah, yeah. There's a difference between having seen a thunderstorm and having been hit by a thunderstorm, right? Yeah, or something. You know? Yeah, and the, yeah. There's a difference. You have to measure the right thing. Yeah, there's a difference between uh, you know being uh, part of a spray attack that targets thousands and thousands of people and being so, being part of an attack that specifically targeted you, and one is not the same as the other. Exactly. Let's talk about this ris Raspberry Pi hang instruction. What's this about? Yeah, so there's a, a, a unimplemented or unfinished instruction built in the Raspberry Pi processor. Oh. So if you run this one instruction via this little bit of assembly code they include here, uh, the Raspberry Pi will hang. And Aww. it's gone until you power it off and power it back on. Womp womp. So that means that anybody who has... Uh, it, it's an unprivileged instruction, so any regular user can do it. Uh, so if I can... You know, if I have SSH access to it, oh, or I if gotcha. I have, if I have any control at all uh, over your Raspberry Pi, I can hang it. Mm -hmm. So basically, this is like uh, an exploit that it's a dial of service attack against all Raspberry Pis. All I have to do is get your Raspberry Pi to run this one instruction on the CPU, and it will hang and not come back until you power cycle it. Hmm. That's kind of cute, kind of Whoops. adorable. Alan. Doesn't affect Raspberry Pi too. Whoops. <laughs> Although there might be a similar thing on the Raspberry Pi 2 yeah. we just haven't found yet. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but mostly they talk about how the Raspberry Pi was easier to go through all the instructions than on x86 because it's less complicated. Oh, I, yeah, I guess so. I guess so. So it's easier to find that kind of thing. Hmm. 
All right, well, that brings us to the end of this week's TechSnap program. We will be live next week at 11 a.m. Pacific, a little bit earlier than normal, which I believe is 2 p.m. Eastern, Alan. Is that 1800 UTC? 1800 UTC. Wow, look at me remember Memorize that. that. I did, wow, didn't that's I? That's the first time ever. <laughs> no. <laughs> I only knew the 1800 one off the top of my head. I was distracted when you asked me earlier, uh, but because it's the time we do... BSD now. I know, I know. It's a miracle. After 230 episodes. Now, I won't remember next week, so don't worry. Uh, also, jo join us live over at jblive.info if you don't want the video or you need like a BAM with conscious version. We have audio streams over there. But we really do love to have you join us live because we've got the chat room. We take your feedback live. And we also, just a reminder, really looking for your emails. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact and send in your tech snap question. We'd love to answer it because we're recording two mm -hmm. episodes mm -hmm. next week. All right, everybody, thanks so much for tuning in this week's episode of TechSnap, and we'll see you right back here next week.